Hello, everyone. So um, uh, welcome, uh, welcome to my talk, and welcome to the conference. I'm one of the co-founders here. Um, I, I helped set this up uh, five years ago uh, when we started the first Pi Data London, uh, when we had 200 people or so, and then uh, over five years, we've grown to 500 people. Um, and I'm really happy with the growth of our ecosystem. Um, I'm not really a unicorn data scientist. I joked at that to, uh, to Sandrine. I didn't think she'd actually say it. I do not self-identify as a unicorn at all. Um, I'm just a data scientist, senior data scientist. I've been doing this for quite a long time, um, but just a data scientist. Um, so I'll be talking today on creating uh, correct classifiers. I had a bit of a shock when I checked the schedule last night, um, or yesterday afternoon, and I saw that Gail Vedicor, is Gail, did he come in the room? He's not in here, oh, God damn it. All right, so Gail um, gave uh, a rather excellent tutorial on debugging your classifiers uh, and estimators uh, last night, and I read the abstract and just thought, oh my God, how much are we overlapping? And it turns out not so much, which is handy. Um, how many people went to Gail's tutorial yesterday? I've got over half of you, right, okay, well, I'm glad I'm not overlapping uh, quite so much then. Uh, for those of you that didn't go to it, uh, the material for Gail's talk will be uh, online as a video, and I urge you to go and uh, watch it. Gail covered a lot of very interesting points. Definitely worth catching uh, that. And I think I've linked it in the appendix at the end of my slide, so you can get a link from there when these go online. So, who am I? I'm an engineering data scientist, so I do not have a PhD. I do not have um, the, I do not have the typical academic data scientist background. I've made everything up as I've gone along for 15 years. And it turns out with lots of trial and error, lots of error and some things that work, and you keep, keep hanging on to the things that work, in the end you get kind of good at something. And that's, that's kind of handy. So I've been doing that for 15 years. Um, I was employed at the beginning in some startups. Uh, and then I started consulting after that, and I've been happily consulting ever since. I get to work on a wide variety of problems. So I'm slightly a jack of all trades. Turns out I am getting some deeper domain knowledge in certain areas over the years. Um, but I, I have a, like a rich intellectual life tackling different problems. It makes me really happy. And it's one of the reasons why um, I promote the growth of our PyData ecosystem, because more interesting people come every month to the meetups. Uh, how many people come to the meetups, at least one of our meetups? All right, so not enough of you. So more of you should come to our meetups because then we go to the pub afterwards and I get to have beers with really interesting people and I get to learn stuff. And that makes me happy. And that's why I do all of this. It's hard to get onto the meetups. It is? Okay, all right. There's, we do have a scaling issue. Um, I do encourage uh, horizontal scaling. We can't do vertical scaling anymore with the meetups. 200 people every month is the size of my first ever conference. And we run that for free now with AHL, one of our sponsors outside. We can't keep scaling that up. Um, not for free every month. That's an unfair burden on all of our volunteer organizers. Uh, so we encourage horizontal scaling with more meetups. But for those of you that can make it along, or just come to the pub afterwards. The pub, you can just walk into the pub afterwards. Come and join us for drinks. Um, so I work with a, a lot of different companies over the years, um, various financial groups. I'm working with QBE Insurance at the moment. They're one of our sponsors. Um, and one of my colleagues will be talking after the break, uh, Liam, on some of the challenges in the insurance industry. So if you're at all curious about problems where you have really distorted long tail distributions with lots of no events, huge numbers of no events, and then small numbers of really, really long tail events, um, which is quite different to many other industries. I urge you to come and attend Liam's talk, um, or go and meet um, some of the, uh, the team out there and just talk about it. The, the stats are really interesting. Um, obviously, I'm a founder of Pi Data London. I've got some of my co-organizers in here. Um, we're all volunteers building up the meetup and the conference over the years. Um, I run um, Model Insight, that's my consultancy with a couple of other colleagues, and I blog on ianoswell.com. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, I've got loads of past talks up on my blog and loads more material. I've also written a book, High Performance Python, that's this one here. I'll be doing a book signing, free books, right? There's three of us doing book signings, um, Holden with Spark, Steve Holden with um, Python reference uh, and my high performance. We'll be doing it after this, during the lunch break. There'll be a queue. When the books run out, the books run out. They're free, first come, first served, one book each, signed by the author. Of course, you want to come and get one of these books. Um, but there'll be a long queue, so you better get there quickly. Um, before I begin my talk proper, um, NumFocus backs all of the PyData uh, conference uh, and supports all of the meetups around the world. We've got, I think, 97 meetups uh, at the moment. I'm giving a keynote in a couple of months' time. I want to get to 100 meetups by then. So if anyone wants to start a regional uh, PyData event around the world, I want three more in the next three months so I can claim 100 meetups uh, in PyData um, by the time I speak at this uh, keynote at EuroPython. Um, one of the key organizers behind NumFocus is Leah. Leah's been here every year. 
The reason you're here is because of Leah's efforts. She runs everything in the background. She's a hidden figure who brings every one of the PyData conferences together. She broke her foot recently, and so she couldn't travel. So she's a bit poorly. She's recovering. She'll be fine, but she can't be here. She really misses the London community. So who in the room has got Twitter on their device right now? Hands up. I suspect more of you than that. Hands up. <laughs> Come on. Honestly, hands up if you've got Twitter on your device right now. That's a bit more like it. Right, every one of you, no excuses, every one of you, please send out a tweet to NumFocus with a message along the lines of, Leah, get well soon from London, or thanks for helping to organise Pi Day to London, or any other kind of positive wish. And I don't want one or two, I want every one of you who has got Twitter on your phone, because you're here, because Leah, one of the unspoken heroes, helped to provide everything that happens around here. And she's feeling a bit poorly, she'll feel so much better if she realises that Pi Day to London's community are thinking about her. So please send out a message to Atnum Focus, Leah, get well soon, or thank her for, for, for bringing this all together. Um, and that will make the world a little, little bit of a better place today, and that'll be lovely. So goals today. We're going to look at developing a baseline model for your classification. The same, uh, same general approach applies to regression. I spent last year talking about some regression problems, and I've got a bunch of notebooks dealing with regression and diagnosing them, uh, diagnosing those models. Uh, so this year, I'm going to talk a bit more about classification diagnostics. So we get a baseline model to make sure that we are progressing from a baseline. Uh, we're going to talk about visualizing errors and diagnosing why predictions uh, are being made um, and why problems are occurring. We're going to improve our ability to communicate about our models to our colleagues, especially non-data scientist colleagues. Um, I've got a GitHub repo. I've got a whole bunch of GitHub repos, but the one that matters here is data science delivered. I've been slowly collecting a pile of advice. It's kind of advice that I wrote to myself 10 years ago that I wish I'd heard 10 years ago. So rather than this bumpy self-taught lesson over um, 15 years, I could have taken a bit of a shortcut. So I've got a bunch of advice in that data science delivered and a bunch of notebooks. The notebook that generates the examples here isn't in there yet, but it will be in a couple of days' time once I've tidied it up. I've been hacking quite furiously at that. Um, but you should check out um, that data science delivered uh, GitHub repo. It's just under my name, so it's uh, Ian Oswald on GitHub. So I'm going to introduce a bunch of tools that uh, help us to prepare for machine learning. Um, just a couple of tools. First one, pandas profiling. Who's used pandas profiling? All right, hardly any of you. Brilliant. So pandas profiling. That um, the little tiny screenshot at the top, pandas profiling. Profile report bracket df. You pass in a data frame you get a lovely, rich visual output around your data frame. Um, so it's a bit like calling um, .info and .describe on your data frame, but rather than getting a data frame back full of text, which you have to try to interpret and think through, you get a bunch of diagnostic information. This is one of two slides on it. So in this case, it's the, uh, the Kaggle Titanic data set that I'm using. And how many people have used the Kaggle Titanic data set? I'm guessing the majority of you, right? So it's how many people survived or died on, um, uh, on the Titanic ship. It's a classic machine learning data set. It's quite small, 891 observations, so not big data at all, um, less than 1,000 lines. Um, 15 variables. Um, there's some missing data. Takes up a couple of kilobytes. Not very, not super interesting from a richness point of view, but great for diagnosing things. Um, you can get a count of the variable types in there, so it tells you that there's some numeric types, some categorical, some booleans. Fine. Um, the warnings, I think, are the interesting bit. So some of the columns have got missing values, and if you if you're working on a new data set, and I often pick up a new data set with a client to go and investigate, can we do something with this? I get a diagnostic, look, there's a bunch of uh, data missing. 20% of the values in the age column are missing. You've got to do something about that. OK, fine. Um, I've got high cardinality on some of my columns. So some of the text features, um, they're, just, they're all unique. So it's very high cardinality. Maybe that's interesting, maybe not. Maybe um, the reports of some of my columns having lots of zeros, maybe zeros is bad. That's missing data, perhaps. In this case, fares and parents, children, siblings and spouses, Parch and SIBSP, that just means there are counts of zeros, and that's totally legitimate. But for some data sets, maybe this is flagging a problem. The last line, I think, is kind of interesting. They're the one that's rejected. So I've made an age-imputed column. I've imputed the median. I'll show that in a moment. 
um, and it is highly correlated with the age column. Of course it is. Um, if it turns out you've got hundreds of columns in a data set and you haven't yet done some kind of correlation check to see what's in there, this tool will just tell you, look, some of your columns are correlated. Maybe you don't want to put those into your linear model uh, in your, on your first go at a problem or into any model. Maybe you just want to pick a subset of your columns that aren't so correlated. Uh, so that's kind of handy to get an overview of your data set. You can drill into different columns in the data. So that's the age column, that top two thirds is the display, you get that per column. So you get some more descriptive data, quantile statistics, descriptive statistics. There are four tabs worth of things, example data, top counts, bottom counts, um, for every feature that you've got. And you get a little distribution being drawn out. So you just get a visual check as to what's in there. So if you were to throw this up on an overhead and then show your colleagues, look, this new data set, here's a couple of key columns that I've pulled out for a sample of the data, and this is what it looked like. Does it meet your understanding of the, the business that's behind this chunk of data that you've given me as a data scientist? And they go, oh, yeah, that looks right, that looks right. That one's got so much missing data. Why is that? So it's an easy communication aid. Um, and it even covers things like uh, categorical data. That embarked column has got three single characters, uh, the embarkation points, and you get a little um, bar chart counting. Um, so it handles all the, all the major data types, which is very nice. It also does some more uh, correlation coefficient stuff. So we've looked at our initial data. And we're happy with what we see. We want to start building a machine learning model. And the number of times, and I have done this as well, the number of times, think, oh my god, I've got this data, it's brilliant, I'm going to build myself a random forest, there may be XG boost, maybe I want to parallelize it, maybe I can draw some stats, but I don't really care about that, I want to do the fun stuff. And you dive in, and you build a model, and you get a result, it's brilliant, I've got a result, this must be great, this must be a great result. And you forget to check what the underlying behavior of the data set is, because maybe you've learned nothing at all, maybe you've built a really complicated model that predicts the mean, or just the average guess. I've done that, I've seen plenty of people do it, and every now and again, well, actually, yeah, as a, as a senior, I do have to step in and say, right, hang on, let's stop, let's go back, let's just take an average, let's just see what the baseline is. Because if we're not improving beyond the average, we don't need a complicated model to make the average, we can just take the average. And simplicity always beats uh, complexity. Uh, so, certainly from a diagnostic point of view. So, scikit-learn has a dummy classifier. Who has used the dummy classifier and the dummy regressor? Not enough of you. So, and okay, right, maybe you've taken the mean and you haven't had to use the dummy, you know, who knows. Um, but you should be using this as your first step. I tend to go into any data set and try at least some kind of um, baseline result. Uh, so you can import the dummy classifier. <clears throat> there are various strategies that you can use. In Gail's talk yesterday, uh, Gail mentioned using the default, which is a stratified sample of the data set. I tend to use most frequent. For me, if I'm communicating with a colleague that I've got a data set, I know nothing about the features, but I've got this, uh, this column that I'm trying to predict, either a classification column or a regression column. Um, sorry, in a classification case, I can say that my best guess as to the answer is the most frequent answer. It's just the dumbest thing that I could do. So I tend to go with most frequent, and then I want to see if a model is outperforming this dumbest possible guess. So I take the dummy classifier. It works just like any of the other classifiers. I make a train test split, fit it, Fitting it takes X train, but it doesn't use X. It's only going to look at the distribution of the, uh, the target column, Y train. And then you score it. You pass an X test. It doesn't use that, but it fits the, the format, the interface of a, a classifier. And it only uses Y test, and you get a score out. So this is telling me, on that train set, the most frequent answer is that uh, survived, uh, uh, survived true or false. Most people died. I know that was the case with Titanic. Um, and if it predicts that you died, then it gets it right most of the time, 63% of the time in this case. Here's a question for you. With the strategy of most frequent, and you give it another train test set, it will be the case that everyone, the majority of people have died. Okay, that's just going to be the case every time you run this. Will I get the same score out? Somebody give me an answer. If I run this again, run train test split, fit score, will I get the same score? The answer is the same. The majority of people died, so you predict died. Will I get the same score? Yes. How many people say yes? No one going with the risky option. How many people are saying no? I guess it's everyone. All right, you're right. So um, because you're taking a different train test split, you get a different distribution of ones and zeros in your test set. So when you score, you get a different answer, slightly different answer. How different, I hear you thinking? Well, if you do 100 folds, you get the mean. So great, we get 0.62 as the mean. But look at that distribution, 0.55 to 0.675. That's quite a wide distribution. Just guessing the majority case, 
but with different test folds, you end up with a wide variation in our predictive ability. And this ties into a point that Gail was making yesterday. If you start building super, super, super optimized classifiers or regressors, whatever, uh, some kind of super optimized estimator, and you're not taking into account the underlying variance in your data set, you can be super optimizing away with your parameters and your features, but actually, you're not predicting any better. Your numbers are getting better, but if you're operating in that noise bound, then you know, that's, that's quite a wide noise bound, right? If I run my dummy classifier twice, I could just say one of them naturally looks better than the other because it gets a better score, but that's rubbish. That doesn't represent reality at all. It's just variance in the, uh, in the generation of these test folds. And if we draw it, we get an idea of what that variance looks like. So it's really simple and to communicate this to your colleagues. So I encourage everyone to start uh, with something like this. Another thing that happens certainly in the, uh, this Titanic Kaggle data set is you impute um, your missing data because scikit-learn's classifiers don't like missing data. XGBoost will handle missing data, scikit-learn random forest classifier won't, so we need, to, we need to address that missing data somehow. So a typical answer is to impute it and impute it using the median is a, a commonly used approach. And then nobody draws the resulting distribution and doesn't have an idea in mind as to how distorted things can look. So on the left, we're not showing the 177 uh, missing data, NAN um, rows. We're just drawing all the true ages and we get a nice distribution. There are many kids and then there are many kind of 18-ish year olds and then it drops off towards uh, older age people. And then if we impute, the majority of the data set is age 28 apparently. And that's a lie, right? We've just made this up. People ask me my position on imputation. I said, well, imputation is a synonym for lie, in my opinion. <laughs> and it's OK if we're lying and we know why we're lying about the data, but we're making stuff up. We're creating a fiction, and we're hoping it represents, represents reality. Maybe it doesn't. And when you draw that, and you think, well, hang on a minute. Is it the case that really everyone truly looks like a 28-year-old? Well, no, they don't. And if you go back to the raw underlying data, it turns out they really, really don't. It might work in a classification context, but you want to know what kind of distortions you're introducing into your data. And if you're missing the majority of data in a column and you start imputing and not drawing the result, and then you were to draw the result and show it to a colleague, they might well laugh and just say, but that, that data you're using doesn't represent the reality over here at all. That's, you know, why are you doing that? So if you draw things, you get, uh, you get ahead of those kind of questions. Very important. So we've made a, a dummy classifier. We've prepared our data. We've drawn it. We're happy we're not making things up. So let's go and build uh, a better, uh, some kind of better estimator. We could get super excited. Uh, we could go for XGBoost or LightGBM or maybe a deep neural network or something crazy. Um, but we don't need to. The first thing I always suggest you do is step back and use something very reliable that uh, handles nonlinearities and interactions in the data. So random forest, scikit-learn's built-in random forest, incredibly well debugged. It just works. Won't give you the best answer on the planet, but it's going to give you an answer that won't get you fired, which is very important. You're just not going to get it wrong, right? It's going to be better than the mean answer, which better be, otherwise you've got nothing going on in your feature set. And it should be better than your mean answer. So you're, you've got this baseline, your dummy classifier, then you've got a new baseline, this random forest. This is untuned, so 10 estimators, unlimited depths, no hyperparameter tuning, just the basics. I get a much better answer. And if I look at that distribution, so my mean has gone up from 0.62 to 0.83, and my minimum value, 0.76, is much bigger than the previous minimum value. So things have improved. Brilliant. So I, I could be pretty happy that things have, have become better. And if we draw the two of them together, this is another really easy way to communicate to colleagues that I've made an improvement. I draw the random forest, that distribution's up, up and better, and the dummy classifier is down and worse. So brilliant. I can visually uh, communicate quite happily that even within the bounds of the, the noise in my train test variations, running it many times, the worst random forest result is still better than the best dummy classifier result. Brilliant, right? This is, this is no nonsense. It's just better. Now, what I haven't done is taken, say, two different tuned random forests where one has got a slightly better mean than the other and then overlaid their distributions. And you can bet your bottom dollar the distributions are basically going to overlap. I mean, maybe one looks kind of convincingly by eye to be a bit better, but often the mean might be slightly better, but that distribution, that variance will be wider. These things will overlap, but it's just not convincing that one's actually better than the other. And then back to Gail's talk yesterday, looking um, at the, the variance you get naturally in your data sets. Um, if you haven't seen his talk, I strongly encourage you to watch it. Um, you begin to sit back and think, well, you know, do I... Do I really trust these slightly better mean results and my increasingly complicated XGBoost ensembled models? It's, 
do I really, you know, am I getting genuine benefit or am I just overfitting my data set and not representing reality at all? Because when you, when you hit reality, there's all a whole bunch of other variants that comes into play. So we want a simple, reliable, robust method that will work over time and can be diagnosed and that someone else can pick up. Otherwise, you're the one unicorn, I call myself a unicorn, you're that one unicorn who understands your super ensembled model and if you leave or get hit by a bus, no one else understands it and the business has got a massive great business risk. And we don't want that. We want companies to be comfortable with the use of machine learning. So we want robust, simple tools that just work day in, day out. Um, who's used the uh, yellow brick library? Almost nobody, not enough people, right. And I can say this because they very, I kept filing bugs, so they, they kindly made me a core um, committer on the project. So <laughs> I can encourage you to come and, uh, come and join, use it, find more bugs, help me figure out how to fix some of these bugs. Um, so the Yellow Brick project is a wrapper that takes scikit-learn estimators and tells you things about them visually. So there's a bunch of visual diagnostics you can get from the scikit-learn documentation. Most of it is not about building graphical outputs, though. It's about getting the correct answer in the scikit-learn docs. So Yellow Brick tries to wrap up ways of visualizing all of this. They've got some really simple things like the uh, confusion matrix on a two-class problem. You just get this result. It's not super interesting, right? Um, but if you've got the digits data set when you've got 10 classes, then you have a 10 by 10 matrix, and it colors it in nice ways. And it's a bunch of wrapper code that you would otherwise have to write yourself, and maybe you get it wrong. It comes for free in this library. Um, for regression, you get um, regression prediction errors. Um, so you get nice um, residual plots, uh, and there's a couple of ways of diagnosing things there. Um, they've, they've wrapped up Lasso and a few other things to give some diagnostics, and there's more coming. There's quite an active team behind this. So if, if you haven't used Yellow Brick yet, in fact, if there's one thing you want to get out of today's talk, try Yellow Brick. At least have a look at the website. Um, if they don't have the visualizations that you think would make your life easier, file a bug report and say, hey, I'd like to see something like this. Give them some suggestions so other team members can do something with it. And if you see uh, something there that's useful, give it a go. Because visual diagnostics stick in your brain. We're highly evolved visual creatures. And you can communicate these very easily to a colleague. So we see here, true class, top left corner, 127. So uh, two classes, zero, um, did people uh, live or die while they died? And how many uh, correct predictions for, for died? Well, 127, so a majority result. Most people died and we got it right. Bottom right corner, um, who survived? This is in the test set, a subsample. Well, of the trues who, who did survive, um, then we predicted 61 of them. So that's pretty good. Um, but of the people who died, and we predicted a one, we predicted they survived, that's 12. So that's, that's a little bit wrong. Um, and then uh, of people who did survive, and we predicted they died, 23. So that's a bit wrong too. This gives us some clue as to what's going on in our data, but it doesn't get us further down. And we'll go a bit further into the weeds in just a moment. So one thing I've been playing with recently, I don't know if this has value, I think it has value. Maybe someone else has done this and you can tell me if this has value. I've taken the confusion matrix and then rather than looking at the raw count of things in each of those four quadrants, I've taken the underlying probabilities and histogram them. So if you're in the bottom right corner, it's because your predicted probability was greater than 50% and then it can be between 50% and 100%, so between 0.5 and 1.0 and I've got a histogram. Just You can count how, how confident the model is in these predictions. So for the predictions that end up near 1.0, that's the model saying, oh, it's like 100% likelihood these people survived. Um, and for the true negatives, if all of the predictions there are towards 0%, the model's really confident these people didn't just think they died, it's pretty convinced that they died. So that's great. If I were to look at this and see that those histograms were moving towards the 50% rather than the 0 and the 100%, I might think, well, my confusion matrix numbers wouldn't change. I still get the same counts but the model is much less certain. If they, you know, 45% and 55% for the majority cases, that would feel kind of bad. And if we look at, say, the false positives, you've got um, a small count of cases where the predictions are just over 50%, just over 50%. If we could do something to improve that, maybe we could drag it under 50%, and then it pops into the true negative class, and that would be correct rather than incorrect. So we get an idea as to where the model is going wrong, and maybe we might want to focus our efforts. I haven't used this in anger. I actually do, I've been thinking of me doing this for a while and I developed it for this talk. So this could be guff, right? We might decide this is actually not informative, but I think it is informative and I'm curious for some feedback from you afterwards. Um, and I might actually commit that into the, uh, the Yellow Brick project so that it can be shared around. Um, 
One problem we have uh, in machine learning is choosing uh, which features we want in our model, our feature selection process. Who's used the Eli 5 project? Again, not enough of you. Right, so Eli 5, who knows the Eli 5 meme from Reddit? All right, so you're not like, oh, not even all of you know that. Right, Eli 5, explain it like I'm five. Explain quantum computation as if I'm a five-year-old. Take out the big words, give me the nice, big, uh, easy explanation that I can understand with colors and big symbols, right? Make it, make it super simple. Eli 5 is a Python library that explains it like I'm five for machine learning for scikit-learn. So if your thing fits in scikit-learn, like XGBoost and LightGBM fit into uh, scikit-learn, then Eli 5 can try to explain those predictions for you. That's one of the things it does. Another thing it does is offer this permutation importance feature. So at the top, I'm not using Eli 5. I'm using scikit-learn's random forest feature importances. And as Gail again mentioned yesterday, these are calculated in a model-specific way. And between the models, they're calculated in different ways. So if you're comparing feature importances from a random forest versus the feature importances that come out of your coefficients for a linear model versus XGBoost's feature importances that it reports, they're calculated in different ways. So maybe they're not comparable. Permutation importance, that's a pretty nifty idea. I've trained my model. I've done, I've, I'm done with my train set. Put it to one side. I've got my test set. If I run my model over the test set, I get some kind of accuracy score coming out or some kind of score coming out the end. If I then randomize one column of my test data at a time, I randomize it, I put it, so I just, I take the same values and permute them up and down randomly. So it's the same distribution, but just randomized in order. Everything else in the test set is the same. I put it through my classifier, I get the same score out. My score didn't get any worse. That column's completely uninformative, right? That, that the classifier is not using that column. If I permute the second column, and my score gets massively worse. There's a huge delta in those scores. That means that second column is incredibly important to that model. And you run through each column one at a time, and you find out which columns, if you permute them, make the worst change to the model. And it turns out if you permute is female, that one just really, really messes up the result. It breaks everything. So you, that's an incredibly important column. And if you did this for different models, you get a model agnostic way of measuring single value feature importance. Now, it's single value. It won't take account of correlations in data or anything else. Only doing one variable at a time. But I think this is a, I don't know if it's better, but it gives a different insight as to which things are working well or not in models. So I encourage you to have a look at this. Uh, we can pull out worst errors by row. This is something I've been doing for a bunch of years. It's the easiest way to find out that I've messed up my data preparation or my data preparation has been lying to me because the underlying data is broken. So you get, um, you get your truthy values, you get your predicted values, you calculate a delta, you sort biggest deltas first, so biggest errors first, and then you pull up the underlying passengers in this case, so passenger, passenger ID 571. We predicted 0.07, we, so we predicted that they died. Um, actually, they survived. The error is 92%. So if we go back into the raw data, look at passenger ID 571, we might find something interesting. So if we then sort our data, and then we use um, the fancy pandas coloring in a Jupyter notebook, um, we can look at, so the top row is passenger 571. Second class, okay, is female, is false, so it's a man. Um, interestingly, all those mispredictions are men. Now, men are the majority in the data set, so that might just be an artifact, um, but maybe there's something interesting going on there. Um, siblings, spouse, parents, and children totals are very low, so maybe that's interesting. We don't know. Low fares, age imputed, there's quite a variety of ages there. And you think, well, okay, maybe, you know, maybe I need to dig into this some more. Here, because the data's probably straight coming out of a, a Kaggle competition, maybe the data's not at fault. Maybe the model's at fault, and we'll look at that in a moment. With a bunch of my other real world problems, this is where glaringly bad data prep comes out, and I've got zeros rather than 10 millions and other things. Um, so this is brilliant, just for getting uh, a first idea as to what the biggest errors are, and I can go and fix those before I present to anybody else and make an idiot of myself. One thing maybe we want to do is split out our errors by some kind of significant feature. So P-class uh, came out as a significant feature. So if we split out our predictions for first class, so I've got my predictions, then I filter just for the first class people in that prediction set, and then I run a classification report, then I can get some metrics out, precision and recall, and I get some averages, 0 0.84, 0 0.75. So first class was predicted reasonably well. If I split out by second class, my average is 0 0.96, 0 0.96. So for some reason, second class is being predicted better than first class. That might be an artifact of the data. Maybe the model can't do anything about it. Maybe there's a data problem with the first class recording. Maybe it was misrecorded. Maybe the second class is better recorded. Who knows? 
Um, and the number of examples is similar in both. So I, I, you know, I, I want to go and diagnose that. Here's another thing that I made up for this talk. I think this is, inter I think this is genuinely interesting. So one problem that I have when explaining things is I get uh, a row that's in error, and I think, OK, right, this is in error. What does it mean to be in error? Um, what do I need to do to fix this? Um, one thing I want to see is other rows that are like my row. So I get the row that's in error, and I want to find things that look like this row. And I could go and set up um, some kind of tests uh, in uh, uh, queries in pandas, try to filter out a bunch of similar rows by things that I think are important to get a bunch of rows that look similar by, by decisions that I've made. But what if I throw all of the test data into TSNE, so that's an unsupervised um, dimensionality reduction process, chuck it into TSNE, visualize it in 2D, then any data point in feature space that's like another point gets grouped together, and then points that are very dissimilar get grouped a long way away from each other. This is a first step in two steps. So all those um, points that are clustered together, they've got similar features. The target isn't included, just the features, and it's the subset of features that I think are predictive. So I've grouped these results together, and then I've drawn um, circles for survive and crosses for die. That's the truth value. Now we want to see which of the features that group things together feel like they are perhaps not giving us enough truth and then do something with it. So if we take the same result and we color it by the error, so uh, dark like black is low error, so these predictions are correct, and uh, yellow, white, that's really incorrect. That's like 90% wrong. So if we look for some of these regions, I've got that point uh, noted out, oddly similar cluster. There's a bunch of circles there. They're all darkly colored. There's a couple of crosses in there. They're darkly colored. And there's a couple of things that are not mispredicted. The error is, is red. So it's not over the 50% boundary. It's not gone the wrong way. But there is some error there. But it's kind of interesting. There's this whole big bunch of um, individuals who are, who are grouped together in this uh, dimensionality reduction technique. And there's this other region. I called it conflicted, where I've got bright yellow circles. So there's a, a bunch of people who should have survived who are predicted to die. And so it's really wrong. And why is that? But some of the predictions in that space look good. So what if we, what if we group by x and y and then dig into it a bit further? So if we take the oddly similar region first of all and then draw out the underlying features, we see that almost all the individuals are third class. OK, fine. Um, is female is false for almost all of them. So most of them are men. Um, low counts are fair and uh, family size. But look at that age imputed. What's special about 28? It's a lot. Well, well done for using my terminology, Jonathan. Uh, yes, yeah, so we've made that number up. Now, that might be important. It might not be important. I don't know. But it kind of feels suspicious to me. And at this point, I mean, I didn't go hunting for a region to tell a story. I just grouped a region that looked interesting. And I went, oh, it's kind of interesting, actually. That's, hey, maybe this crazy idea I had has some value. Um, so I then went back to the, uh, the Wikipedia page on who lived and died and what was their, their, all their details, and I looked at the, um, these individuals, and sure enough, all those ages are very different to 28. So this making up data, I mean, I don't know if it hurts the classification. Most of these classifications are correct, so maybe it didn't hurt in this case. But what about the conflicted region? So there, if we look at, uh, okay, they're mainly first class for the people that it got wrong, but of those first class people, the age imputed is typically 28 again. So we've got a bunch of made up data in a region where it's getting lots of errors. It's mispredicting either way. And I think that's interesting. I mean, I, in this data set, again, it was kind of you know, it was high variance as to whether you lived or uh, survived, sorry, survived or died, whether you got near a lifeboat or not. So maybe we can't diagnose this any further without better information about where passengers were and where the boats were and that kind of thing. But if I see that kind of thing in my real-world uh, machine learning challenges, and I see areas of high conflict, and it's where I've started making up data, or I've got missing data, I'm going to get pretty damn suspicious pretty quickly that maybe my underlying data is wrong. And it's not the machine learning technique, but the underlying representation of reality that's at fault, at which point I need to go and fix that. There's no point fixing the machine learning. I've got to go and fix the underlying data. So I think that's an interesting diagnosis. Uh, and then I'm going to wrap up um, in a couple of slides. So I mentioned Eli 5 earlier. One thing we can do with Eli 5 is explain an underlying prediction. And this is really quite handy for communicating results to non-domain uh, specialists. So in my case, working in insurance at the moment, I sit with underwriters and actuaries and say, look, this is why the model is making this prediction. They don't know anything about data science. They use Excel typically, so there's, a, there's quite a gulf in terms of um, modeling understanding. But they've got all the business domain knowledge that I don't have because I'm not an underwriter or an actuary. 
So I can explain um, these kind of results in an insurance context, and they go, oh, yeah, that makes sense, that makes sense. That's, why would it do that? And I go, ah, oh, that's kind of interesting, because I don't know either. I better go and dig into this. I bet the data's wrong, and sure enough, the data's going to be wrong in that case. So we get some shared understanding. So here, um, the left-hand example, we look at one um, passenger, 231. They survived. Why did they survive? Why is the probability of survival 0.997? Well, according to this diagnostic method, and it's not like the only diagnostic method, but this is a pretty good diagnostic method, I think, if you pull out the underlying probability contributions for each of the major features in this complex set of multi-layer trees that go into a random forest and it works on XG Boost and the rest, if you pull out the underlying contributions that are summarized by this process, it says, well, look, the, the likelihood of survival is 38%, so it's less than 50%, but because is female is true, so this person's a woman, we increase that survival likelihood by 30% according to the model's interpretation of the data. Their first class at another 13% on top, um, and they paid quite a high fare, 83 pounds was quite high, so we had another 11% on top. And this adds up to our 99.7% likelihood of survival, so that's interesting. Look at someone who died, well, 61% likelihood of death, so that's the easy guess. And that increases because they had a larger family. And it increases because they're in third class. And it increases because they paid a, a, a fare that, relative to the family size, is quite small, so you know, third class uh, in steerage. But interestingly, this person is also a woman. So that decreases the likelihood of death by 25%. But still, the sum total of that is 95% likelihood of death. So if you explain this to a domain specialist, who doesn't understand the machine learning, but can see why this clever black box is making some of its predictions, particularly the top things that are changing that prediction. It really helps with communication. Now, that's explaining things without context. One thing I've started playing with is drawing a distribution of the interesting features. So here we say, okay, is female is my most predictive feature after the bias, the, the mean of the data set. So where are we in is female? Okay, it's a binary column, so it's zero or one. So we're in the majority, okay, fair enough. Looking at sibling, spouse, parents, and children, most people have zero. Some have one, some have two. Very few have five. So that's kind of interesting. Maybe there's something interesting about having such a large family. Maybe that applies to other examples where you have a large family. Um, they're in third class, and they're age imputed. You can see, okay, the red bar is telling us where their age is, and the age here is, what, 16. But you can see that spike for that 28-year-old age imputed coming up. All right, and I'm being told, game over, so... I'm not going to talk about this, except that I'm going to talk about it in Amsterdam. And uh, I reckon you should diagnose all of your machine learning just like you debug your code. I've been pushing that message for a couple of years. I think it's what you have to do. I'm interested in running some training around this kind of thing, some kind of interactive exploration. I'm interested to know if any of you want that kind of thing. Come and talk to me and give me some feedback. There'll be a write-up on ianoswell.com, my blog. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I have a request. One thing I hadn't been doing for years is asking for anything in return. I put a bunch of time in. All of our volunteer speakers put a bunch of time in, and we never ask for anything. I've started asking for postcards. As a result, I've been receiving postcards. I've got a section of all where I have postcards coming up telling me that someone liked my talk, and that I, it makes me happy. So please make me happier. Send me a postcard. Send me an email. I'll send you my address. Send me a postcard from anywhere in the world. I don't care when or where from. Uh, just send me a postcard. It'll make me happy. Um, and yeah, go and check out that notebook, and, oop, and there's an appendix slide, which when it goes online, I'll have some more links in, and that'll give you some more background reading. Thank you very much. So we have seven minutes until lunch. So do we have any questions? No questions, everyone's hungry? That's totally acceptable. Em, then you got a question? Yeah, so the whole agent beauty column, I appreciate that's probably partly done to help explain bad bits of the model. But if you just did some decent sort of sampling on the distribution that you have for the ages, uh, presumably it would just sort of bump the column to stay. You mean you have to throw in the records? Is there kind of a general pattern that makes that better? Right. Um, Edmund's asking, is there a better way of doing imputation, so making up these numbers? Um, no, but there's ways you can work around it. Because if you're missing the data in your test set, you've got to do something about it. Um, so one way to do it is to build a classifier with age present and build a classifier without age present. And then when you've got test data with age, you can use one classifier. And then when you're missing it, you can use the other one. Or maybe you can build up an estimator which predicts one or the other and tries to fill it in. Have you got a... Yeah, I can answer this. Question. Oh, go on, please. Uh, can I use the mic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So the problem Ian was talking about is solved by what's known as multiple imputation. The idea, so the problem with imputation is if you want to do post hoc analysis after you impute, and you impute by some fixed, con you forget the variance. So there's a whole literature in multiple imputation, and there are better ways of, there are many ways of doing it. I was thinking the simplest way of doing it would be to sample in, in, the, uh, in the distribution of the variable that, that you're imputing, and then, you know, random forest or an assembled model, so you would sample in this, and then you would average random forest. Let's implement this in scikit-learn. Okay. Multiple imputation. Um, we want to add things to scikit-learn. Uh, another question? Another question? So yeah, what happens when you can't fit all your columns on a screen? Um, and, and genuinely a tough problem. Um, if you've got lots of columns, but only a couple are informative, then you can pull out just the columns that are interesting. Because when I'm communicating to a colleague, I don't care about all the minor effects most of the time. I just care about the major effects. So I try and explain just a subset of the columns. And when I've got millions of rows and I want to diagnose, maybe I take a subsample of thousands. Um, when you've got really weak features, so you need hundreds of thousands of features with tiny contributions each, I don't have a straight answer for that. Uh, there, I don't think there is an easy way to explain that at the moment, um, except for probably lots of paperwork and figuring it out, figuring a story that you can tell that ties it all together. Um, I don't know if there's... I mean, Gail might have a, a different answer given his experience with brain imaging, and there's, there's a lot of data going into that. Um, any thoughts? Or? Yeah, sure. I mean, some, I mean, it's really tool-specific. Some of these tools will work well. I mean, feature importance is... Uh, uh, computing the gradient of a local sample will work well. Uh, uh, and then, you know, it varies. But some, some things in theory should work well, then you've got implementation problems. Uh, yeah, but it's I mean, tough. lots of these things are very scalable. I mean, defi define big. Yeah, but calculating feature importance out of that isn't difficult. I mean, if you've got hundreds of thousands of columns, and they've all got a, a similar tiny feature importance, then finding the truly useful individual columns that you can tell a story around, that's hard. And I, yeah, I don't have a straight answer for that. But when you have 100 million features, it's usually sensor data, like brain imaging or something like this. And then, you know, go back to the sensor data. Go back. So it's an image, represented as an image. Uh, final question, or should we break for lunch? I think we should break for lunch. Let's break for lunch. Thank you very much, everyone.